Good morning, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Uh, this is actually the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. So let's start with a shout out to Earth Day founder, Senator Gaylord Nelson, environmental leader, Sen environmental leader Dennis Hayes, and the 20 million Americans who came out for the very first Earth Day in 1970. 20 million, that's like 10% of the population back then. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Crazy. Uh, oh, we should also recognize author Rachel Carson, whose book Silent Spring helps set the stage for all that. And um, the Environmental Protection Agency, which formed at the end of that year, and which, when guided by truth and science, can be a thing of beauty. <laughs> uh, in addition to all of those things, we're also celebrating the birth of another great force for environmental education and protection and adoration, Allison Young. Happy birthday, yeah. Allison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Okay, so today, Rebecca and Allison, co-directors of the Academy Citizen Science Program, have come back to Breath Blue Club to tell us about um, another really powerful moment, movement Sorry, for um, supporting nature around the globe. But before we get into that, I realize that we've actually said the phrase citizen science a lot in this program, but never really defined what it is. So can we start with that? One of you help us with what is citizen science? Go for it, Rebecca. Sure. So I'll start and then you can add in. <laughs> so... Um, citizen science is really people everywhere working together to further the scientific endeavor. People who are paid to do science and people who are not paid to do science. Um, so professionals and non-professional scientists alike working together to solve some of the most important problems of our time. And when we say citizen in this case, we were really just using it as a word for everyone, right? Citizen of the world is basically right, exactly. kind of what, it, what it really means in this context. Okay, yeah, nature belongs to everyone, science belongs to everyone. This is a way to support both. Awesome. Exactly. exactly. Okay, cool. Um, well, thank you guys so much again for coming back. Thank you to everybody watching today. Um, a reminder that you can ask questions anytime just by leaving them in the comment section, and we'll loop back at the end to ask um, Rebecca and Allison some of those. And um, without further ado, City Nature Challenge 2020, bring nature to you and connect with people around the world, even if you are sheltering in place. Thank you guys. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Laurel. Awesome, yeah, so let me move on to our first slide here. Um, yeah, so not only is this the 50th uh, anniversary of Earth Day, this is also the fifth annual City Nature Challenge. So we've been going for five years now, which we're pretty excited about. Um, and I'm gonna start off just kind of by giving you kind of a history of the City Nature Challenge, like what it is and how did it get started and, and things like that and kind of um, what does it look like this year when things look very different um, than they have in the past five years? Uh, and then Rebecca will dive into how do you actually participate um, in the City Nature Challenge this year. So the City Nature Challenge, you can see our logo is down there at the bottom. It's not just something that we came up with here at the Academy. Uh, Rebecca and I, back in 2016, um, were colleagues and friends with the uh, now community science team down at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Um, and both of our programs had always been using iNaturalist. We did very similar types um, of work, but we had never done a project together. Um, and in 2016, uh, the very first National Citizen Science Day was announced. Uh, and this was basically due to the uh, formal recognition by the White House of citizen science as being an important source of data. And they actually started to ask their federal agencies to start developing citizen science programs to get uh, US citizens and US residents and people who are visiting and, and, and live in this area to join and, and take part in the process of collecting data. Um, and so the Citizen Science Association uh, asked people who run citizen science programs and do citizen science work, hey, on this on the Citizen Science Day, which was April 16th that year, like, can you do something fun? Can you do something that promotes citizen science and gets people out there and thinking about um, what it is and why it's important? Um, and so we put our heads together with uh, Leela Higgins down at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, who manages their community science program. And we said, you know what, like we've never done a project together and our cities are such natural rivals. You know, we always, who has the best sports team and who has the best burritos and things like that. So let's make this about a competition about nature. Uh, so in 2016, we launched the first ever city nature challenge, which was just the San Francisco Bay area. So all nine counties that touch the Bay 
versus Los Angeles County. Um, and it was eight days that year. It was much longer than it is now, um, which ended up being kind of exhausting. But we had our first challenge where we tried to get folks who were visiting and living here in the Bay Area and in Los Angeles County to go out and document as much nature as they could. And the challenge was, you know, who can document the most nature, who can find the most species, and who has the most people that get involved. Um, and so that year, uh, we made uh, over almost 20,000 observations, which was great. It was more than we thought in those eight days. Um, but Los Angeles soundly beat us up here in the Bay Area uh, that first year. But one of the really fun outcomes of that is that as we were taunting each other on social media, um, a lot of other people in other cities were just like, oh, what's the city nature challenge thing? And like, how can my city get involved? Like, how do you, how do you sign up? And so uh, in 2017, we decided to open it up to any city in the US. Um, and basically it's just people in those cities who are willing to take on the, the time and the effort and the work to organize it in their city with some help from us and giving them like training and tips and things like that. So in 2017, uh, it was in 16 cities around the US, um, which was really fun. That year we had um, over 125,000 observations, which we were really excited about. Um, and had more than 4,000 people participate uh, in the US, which was great. Uh, and that year, Dallas-Fort Worth made the most observations and Houston found the most species. So those Texas cities really kind of dominated that year. Los Angeles still had the most participants like they had in the year past. So come 2018, we, you know, we had done California, we had done the US and we we're just like, all right, let's make it international now. Anyone who wants to can sign up um, you know, and, and promote this in their city and, and, and make the City Nature Challenge happen for them. So in 2018, we had 68 cities um, for the first ever international City Nature Challenge. Uh, we made uh, over 440,000 observations and had more than 17,000 people participate around the world, uh, which was amazing to us. Um, and that year, the San Francisco Bay Area, we swept the City Nature Challenge. We had the most observations, we found the most species, and we had the most people um, involved, which was um, a pretty big win for us after having two years of it prior where we had didn't even come in um, in the top ones. So in 2019, uh, it's all been word of mouth. We had 159 cities participate last year. Uh, where we made uh, over 960,000 observations and more than 35,000 people around the world um, participated. Um, and this is, uh, at this point, we're down to four days of the City Nature Challenge. It's kind of been this way um, since 2018. Um, last year, Cape Town, South Africa uh, came in. It was the first time participating, but they did an amazing job. They really inspired people to get out there and document the, the nature in and around Cape Town. They had the most observations and they found the most species. And here in the Bay Area, we still had the most people participating, which is great since we've been doing it the longest along with Los Angeles County. So now we're here for the City Nature Challenge 2020, which starts on Friday. Um, and we have uh, about 245 cities around the world who are taking part, um, which is still amazing. You can imagine with all the COVID-19 uh, problems that are happening right now, um, and issues that people are having with it, that some cities, cities had to totally drop out of the City Nature Challenge, um, but a lot of actually cities have come on board that they're looking for something to do, they want people to connect with nature at this time. Um, and so we've actually had a bunch of new cities join us um, just in the last few weeks for the City Nature Challenge this year. So about 245 cities around the world, all of us kind of in various stages of um, you know, lockdown and sheltering in place. And actually some of our cities are kind of starting to come out of it now, our cities in Asia. Um, if you want to know if your city is participating, you can go to citynaturechallenge.org to find the city list. Um, and the way that the City Nature Challenge in the past has really been fueled has been by people coming together and having what we call bio blitzes, where a whole bunch of people come together at one place at one time. They go to a local park, they go for a walk in their forest, and all of them together, they're meeting each other and they're trying to document as many species as they possibly can. Clearly, though, that's can't be the model for this year. Um, so the City Nature Challenge this year, we're actually, um, is probably gonna be the most city that the City Nature Challenge has ever been uh, this year because people really can't go out to those open spaces. We can't hold bio blitzes. Um, and so instead we're really encouraging people to document the nature that they can find in their house, in their yards, around their neighborhoods. Uh, if they still can go to their parks to go out on solo walks or just with their family to see what they can find as well. So the Student Nature Challenge is definitely going to look really different than it has in years past where people are going to you know, big parks and open spaces together and making observations. 
Um, and so this year we're still holding it though. Um, and it starts, like I said, on Friday uh, and goes through Monday. So basically at 12.01 a.m. Friday morning is when the City Nature Challenge starts, regardless of where you are, it's your local time, um, all the way basically until 11.59 p.m. Um, on Monday the 27th. You're supposed to go out there, you're supposed to make and upload observations, take photos of the things that you're seeing, um, the nature of the wild species that you find out um, in, your, in your yard or around your neighborhood. Uh, we have a week. Um, where people can, if you've taken a lot of photos, you need some extra time to get them uploaded to iNaturalist, which Rebecca will talk a little bit about in a sec, um, that you have some time to get all those uploaded. You can help with identifications and other people can help identify things that you saw. Um, and then on May 4th, we're gonna announce the collective results. So in the past, we've always had City Initiative Challenge be a competition where it's, it's, we announce a winner. This year, instead of having a competition, we're really going to embrace the collective side of the City Nature Challenge. The fact that we have 245 cities around the world and everybody in any way that they can that keeps them safe and their family safe and their community safe are still getting out there and connecting to nature, which I think is a pretty amazing story right now. Um, and so on May 4th, we'll announce the collective results of what did we all find together. So this year, we're really encouraging people to look for the wild species they can find in, inside your house or in your yard. Um, instead of going out and doing bio blitzes, it's really about focusing on your really, really hyper local nature. Um, we're encouraging people to try to attract some new species to their yard if they can by putting up bird feeders or doing things like moth lighting, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. Um, if they can walk around neighborhoods to look for those wild species they can find in their neighborhood. We know a lot of neighborhoods might have a lot of trees that have, plant, that have been planted by people or hedges that were planted by people, lots of flowers that people put in their yards. We're less interested in those things that have been actually planted by people and more about those like wild plants that are growing in between those cultivated plants, you know, those weeds that are springing up in places, um, the insects that are using those plants for a habitat or a food source. So really thinking about what are those wild things that are existing with us in our urban spaces. And also, yeah, if you can still go out um, to your parks or open spaces, what can you find on a walk alone or, or just with your family instead of having a big group there and helping you in that process and everyone work, looking together, um, thinking about just going out, you know, with your, uh, just with your family unit and going out on a walk and seeing what you can find. So with that, I'll turn it over to Rebecca to talk about how do you actually participate. <clears throat> All right. Thanks, Allison. Um, so when you're making and sharing observations for the City Nature Challenge, most of our cities um, use the app and website or a platform called iNaturalist. And iNaturalist is an amazing um, tool to make and share observations of nature. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it does and how you can use it. So next slide. Oh. I was going to advance on my computer, but it won't yeah. work. <laughs> So um, with iNaturalist, you can really, what it does is take pictures that you take of plants and animals, so like one species at a time, one thing. It takes that, um, it knows if you're using your app, who you are, where you are, and when you're taking that picture, and um, connects those data, who, what, when, with your photo, and it has... Um, some incredible machine learning that's built in that will help um, identify what you found. And I'll talk more about how that works in just a minute. And so it's really a way for you to turn what your picture that you take of a plant or animal into a data point, into a species occurrence record. And when we say observations that we counted for all those statistics of City Nature Challenge, that's what we're talking about. Um, iNaturalist also keeps a list for you of all the species you've ever uploaded. So it's kind of like your nature notebook of all the things that you've ever seen. And as you can see in this slide, the, on the far side with all the little dots, you can also, when you're holding your phone, you can also explore what other people have seen wherever you are. So if you really want to find a certain kind of flower in your neighborhood and like you're wondering if somebody's seen it, you can open the explore tab and look around and see um, if someone has seen this flower. You can also see if you've made an observation of a species in an area, how many other people have seen that, and maybe you're the first one to see it in that area, and you can see that as well. All right, next slide. So um, if you, when you're using iNaturalist, there are a couple things that are really key. I mean, the most important one, really, is to take a clear photo of just one species, if you can. Sometimes there's more than one species in your picture. Sometimes you can't tell. 
that there's more than one species, but like for this example, you can see this flower here. Like I really zoomed in on this one flower to make sure that it was just one thing. So you take a picture, you share that picture, and then you can see here on this, the middle screen, it says, what did you see? And if you know what that plant is, you can just type the name in. Um, but if you press, if you don't know, or if you don't want to type in the name because you don't know how to spell the genus name, or you don't know what the common name is, um, you can just click, what did I see? And the machine learning works on all of the observations that have been uploaded to iNaturalist that have been ID'd, identified, and it makes suggestions for you based on your photo, how it looks, and also on your location. And so you can see here, for this flower, it made a suggestion of the genus, was the first suggestion, um, but then the next one down, which that's the, we know that that's the genus of this, this flower, but this is a seaside daisy, so I can look at the first, um, the top suggestion there, and it's, if you look closely in the green, it says visually similar and seen nearby. So if it says that, and you can push this little eye and you can learn more about that species and see where it's found and look at other pictures, you can just hit, click that and say, I think that is, it's that. The AI thinks, the machine learning thinks that that's right and I have a, a good um, suspicion based on all the information that this is right. So you can hit, um, pick that one or type in your own ID like I said and then you hit share and it gets uploaded to iNaturalist. All right, next slide. Um, and you can see here there's a process that happens. So first there's a machine learning or your suggestion and you upload it um, and then it's shared on this platform with a community of naturalists. And it takes that community to help, the community can look at your observation and help identify what you found and help confirm either what you have put or what that machine learning has suggested. All right, next slide. Because it really is this community of people online who are making and sharing observations in the way I just described and also helping to confirm those identifications. The community is really this power of iNaturalist. And I think the online community is in incredible. And once you make and share an observation, you're part of that community. Usually during City Nature Challenge, we foster this in-person community, right? So you're working together to discover nature and take pictures and talk about it in person. We can't do that this year, except with our families or the people that we live with. So I think this year more than ever, this online community is so important, like to think about other people are out there on their own making and sharing observations, and then we're all sharing them, and then we're all looking at them and trying to identify them together. And so it really is this like kind of beautiful collective action that we're doing even though we're apart. All right, next slide. Um, so this is just another um, picture of that same flower that just kind of shows you, again, the process. Like, if I took that picture, use the machine learning suggestion, put in the identification, you can see the community members here, Allison and a couple other people, Allison and someone else have identified that. Once um, two thirds of the people agree on the ID, it becomes what's called research grade. And those research grade observations are shared with um, big biodiversity databases, especially one called the Global Biodiversity Information Facility that we as biodiversity scientists use to understand where plants and animals are found. All right, next slide. So we have this little video that we're gonna go through that kind of shows you a phone eye view of how to make an observation. So, this is me making out, this is how to make observations in iNaturalist. This is of me and Allison um, in the park. This amazing video was shot and edited by our colleague, Annie Miller. So you can see we found this little snail. So I opened the app, pushed observe, which is a little camera icon in the iPhone, took a picture of this snail. And then this is the screen here. It shows who, me, it knows it's me. It says it shows when and where I was. I can push this, what did you see? And you can see these suggestions where it's suggesting that it might be in this genus, Oxychilis, and then it has some more specific, the species suggestions below. So we can look at those. And we know, we see this snail a lot, um, but you can also see the first suggestion. It says visually similar and seen nearby. And so we're gonna click, click that one. And then now we have what we think it is. 
We have when this was taken, this was back in February in Golden Gate Park. And then we can say share and it's shared and uploaded with iNaturalist. So anyone can do this with their phone. This is the iPhone screen. The Android looks a little bit different, but the steps are really basically the same. Um, so we just encourage you to get out there wherever you are. If it's in your backyard, taking a walk on your neighborhood, um, take some pictures of the wild plants and animals that you see. If you're here in the San Francisco Bay Area, all you have to do is take a picture and upload it of as many species as you can um, from April 24th to April 27th. And that observation will automatically be uploaded to our San Francisco Bay Area project, City Nature Project. It will also be uploaded to the gigantic worldwide City Nature Challenge project. So I think if you click, Allison, it has some of the, so it's, these are the requirements to have your observations shown in this project. Um, it's all taxa, that means anything, any life, um, plants, animals, mushrooms, evidence of life, so skeletons or shells or scat um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. So for us, for San Francisco Bay Area, that's the nine Bay Area counties that touch the San Francisco Bay. So if your county has any part that touches the Bay, you're in. Um, and it can be any people and any kind of, it doesn't have to be um, identified right away, just upload your photo and um, it will be part of the project and help count, count toward this collective effort to document nature everywhere. And if you're not in the San Francisco Bay Area, you can go to that citynaturechallenge.org to see if your city or metro area, so we say city, but a lot of times it's like a few counties put together or a region around a city to see if your city is participating. And one last thing, if you're in California, 24 counties in California are part of the City Nature Challenge. But even those that aren't, if you can get out, if you live in a county like, let's say Ventura County, which is not part of the City Nature Challenge this year, you can get out and make and share observations on Friday, um, the 24th. And we're trying to encourage all Californians everywhere to make observations on that day together with the California Natural Resources Agency to kind of just say, hey, even if you're not part of the City Nature Challenge, get out there on Friday and make and share your observations. All right, so Allison's gonna talk to you a little bit about, okay, you might know how to find nature like if you're walking on a nature trail, but what can you do um, in and around your home to make really good, fun discoveries? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. So, I mean, that's the amazing thing. The nice thing about using the iNaturalist app is that you literally don't have to know what it is you're taking a picture of. You just have to take a good picture. Um, and so we're really encouraging everybody to get out there um, from the 24th to the 27th and make observations. Don't feel like you have to know, you know, your species. Don't feel like you have to be an expert in anything. Just go ahead and go and take photos of the things that you find around your area. Um, we are encouraging no folks to look for the wild species um, that live in and around your home. So I'm going to give you a few tips on how do you look for wild species when so much of what like, kind of the immediate things you might see are things that have been planted by people or people's pets and stuff like that, which are not wild. So we do have some tips. The first thing I do want to point out, though, is that um, we have two views here. We have let me get my pointer back. We have this is the Android app right here and the iPhone app over here. Um, in both of them, they, they record the same information. They just kind of show it a little differently. Um, both of them have these two fields right here. Um, the first one being location visibility or geo privacy is what it's called in the in iPhone. Um, and then there's this box, this kind of uh, on off switch for is it captive or cultivated or a captive or cultivated on, on the iPhone. So first of all, if you take a photo of something that you know for sure, is not wild. Like if you're just trying out the app and you're like, you know, it's just easiest for me to go and take a photo of like the tomatoes growing in my garden right now. Um, all we ask is that if you know for sure it's not wild, just to click that box and say, this is a captive and cultivated um, species. And that just helps you, um, helps the iNaturalist community and the people who use the data know that someone actually put this species here, it didn't show up on its own. And that's really important when we're looking at like where species are occurring around the world. Um, most people wanna know where they're occurring naturally and on their own. Um, and if you are really worried though about taking a bunch of photos uh, in your house or around your backyard, um, 
that location visibility or the geo privacy, it defaults to open, which means um, it's going to record where you are. And people, when they look at your observation, they can see where that pin was dropped. Um, you can open that up, though. And you'll see the other op uh, options are to have an obscured location or a private location. Um, and if you're uh, concerned about making lots of observations around your house, we encourage you to obscure your location. That means you can still see where you made that observation, but everybody else kind of sees it in a big obscured box that was made somewhere in this like up to 22 kilometer area. It's a pretty large area that people will not be able to figure out where you live with inside of that box, especially because every time you make an observation, it'll obscure to a different area in that box uh, for people. Uh, we encourage you not to choose private because that means that nobody can see the location and your observation will not be associated with any place at all, which means that if you're hoping to participate in the City Nature Challenge, but you mark your observations as private, they're not going to be put in a place. And so they won't actually get at any added to any City Nature Challenge project. Obscured locations still will get added to projects, though. Um, so choose obscured if, if you're um, concerned about making lots of observations around your house. All right, so how do you actually find wild species um, in and around your home. So first of all, uh, in your house, there's been some great studies done um, by the arthropods of your home uh, folks, which is a kind of a citizen science project that one of our curators, Michelle Troutwine, works on as well at the Academy. Um, and there, they have found on average, there's about 93 species of arthropods, so insects and spiders and things like that, that uh, live in pe inside people's homes. Um, and all of, the, all of them are totally benign. They're not there to hurt you. They're not pests. They just happen to be associated with, with humans. Um, so we have things like these guys, which are carpet beetles and carpet moths, because um, they're often associated with carpets. These cute little fuzzy guys, which are actually pretty small, um, are called drain flies a lot of the time, or bathroom flies, because um, they like kind of the wet areas around drains. You have cellar spiders and cellar slugs. Um, and then these guys here are called book lice. And these little um, scorpion looking things are actually pseudoscorpions and people call them book pseudoscorpions or house pseudoscorpions because they eat those little tiny book lice as well. Um, and so we realize some of these are very tiny and you might not be able to get a good photo of them, but the things like the beetles and the moths and even the drain flies, you should be able to get a relatively decent photo of um, just using your phone as well, especially those cellar slugs and those cellar spiders also. So we really encourage you to look inside your house to see what are those wild species that are actually living with you in your home. In your backyard, again, like I said, um, we're not really interested in the, in the things that you've planted in your backyard, but instead the things that are either growing wild between those planted things, um, like the weeds in your backyard, um, a lot of these geraniums or stork bills, stork spills that people call them, um, are wild species, or they're we, we consider them weeds, but they still grow wild, and so they're definitely, feel free to document all those weeds in your backyard. Um, also, species that are using the plants in your backyard as habitat or as food sources, like this crab spider um, or these galls that grow on plants um, are another great things to look for as well. Also, think about the things that might be living in your soil, like these earthworms. And I get these um, super weirdo broadhead planarians in my yard, too. They're often associated with gardens, like a vegetable garden. So if you have a vegetable garden, you know, go and dig in the soil and see what's living um, in those places as well. Also, you could look underneath things in your backyard, especially if you have like potted plants or if you have like a, you know, some like wood down in your backyard for something or a garbage can that's sitting out there. Go ahead and look underneath it. You're bound to find wild things living under there. If you're lucky, you might find things like salamanders or lizards. Um, those are the kind of the more exciting things that might be living under things in your backyard. But you're almost guaranteed always to find something like slugs or snails um, or especially pill bugs or wood lice. Um, those are really common things. Things like earwigs also are really common underneath things in your backyard. So think about looking underneath the things in your backyard when you're trying to find wild species. You can also do really simple things to actually help you kind of capture some of those insects out there. I made, um, this is called a pit trap, but it's definitely like my own homemade version of a pit trap. Um, and entomologists use these all the time out in the field to help them capture insects. Um, and I just use basically a cottage cheese container I dug a hole underneath a plant in my backyard. You want it to kind of, kind of be level with your soil. Um, and then the next morning, sure enough, I had these little pill bugs uh, that had fallen into my pit trap. And it just makes it easy to have them in one place where you can take a photo of them and then just dump them out and let them go. Um, and you can check every morning and see what's, what's in your homemade pit trap. Um, and finally, if you're willing to, you can actually attract species to your backyard. Um, we are encouraging folks, if you have like a white sheet or even just like a white shirt, you can put up, um, this is a UV light, but you can also use just like a regular flashlight as well. Um, and they will actually attract moths. 
um, and other flying insects. And it's really nice because once they land on that sheet, they'll actually stay there. Um, and so it's pretty easy to get photos of them that way. Um, and so um, I often put up both a black light and a flashlight. And so I have kind of both, both kinds of light there. Um, and you can, you can find a lot of species that will do these, um, if, especially if it's a nice warm night, um, put up that sheet and see what, what comes to, to, uh, to the lights that you have out there. And also if you have um, bird feeders or things like that, or have a way to put out bird seed, um, that's a nice way to attract our hummingbird feeders, also nice ways to attract birds to your yard, even like a, just a source of water. Um, will also help attract birds and other organisms to your backyard as well. So um, just ways to get things, wild things into your backyard. So we're really encouraging people this year for the City Nature Challenge to get to know your local weeds because um, they're definitely wild. They might annoy us, but they are wild and they're growing in our urban spaces and we'd love to understand where they're growing and how they're doing. Get to know your local land sales and slugs. Um, these again are things that are pretty easy to find in backyards and neighborhoods all over the place. Um, and the cool thing about land sales and slugs, at least here in California that we find is that you can take a photo of one and it can be uh, like non-native invasive, super common one, or it can be really rare and endemic to California and it's an amazing observation. And so to go ahead and take photos of them, even if you don't know, once you get those identifications, people can tell you if it's a super interesting observation of a native species. And definitely get to know your local pill bugs. We actually have a ton of things that a lot of people call roly polies. There are ones though that don't roll up though called wood lice. Um, they all really look very similar. Um, and although the most common ones are these non-native ones, um, these common pill wood lice, which are what people consider roly polies that are all over the Bay Area and um, all over the world. Um, you can actually find these really rare native ones. Also, this was a photograph taken actually during a bio blitz of the City Nature Challenge last year. Um, and the woman who initially uploaded it, she thought it was one of those common roly polies. And it turned out to be a species that had been described from the Bay Area. So it was first noticed and described in the Bay Area back in the 1930s. Um, and it hadn't basically been seen in the Bay Area since. Even in the 1990s, a group of scientists went out to go to see if they could find it and they couldn't find it in the Bay Area. And she happened to find it looking under a log during a bio blitz and she thought it was just one of those common roly polies or wood lice. And it turned out to be this amazing discovery that we now have a collection of at the Academy, uh, which is great. Um, and so if you want help, if you want to, uh, you know, kind of a, a resource that helps you kind of remember all these ways to find local um, wild things in your local spaces, in your backyard, in your neighborhood, and in your house, we put together this resource. Um, it's just this bit.ly home CNC, um, which is all about finding nature in and around your house for the City Nature Challenge. So that's there for you to download and use and, and use as a resource to help kind of, it also has other tips as well about um, finding species in your backyard. So I'm going to turn it over to Rebecca to talk about some of the amazing things people have found during the City Nature Challenge. Thanks, Allison. Um, we thought it would be fun to to end with, um, or like wrap, get to wrapping it up with some amazing finds from City Nature Challenges past. And so I went through um, all the international organizers from all over the world kind of submit to us their best finds um, or best finds of their community. And then we also look through all of the, the finds, which is a lot. I mean, like last year, there were close to a million observations. So clearly we're not looking at every single one in detail, but um, I tried to find some really nice things that were found really close to city centers. So not in like nature preserves, but it's, I, I, that's pretty, I also looked and found some from nature preserves too, because I thought you might want to see them. So, um, this first um, flower is an orchid from um, Colombia, um, and it was the first record of this species ever made on iNaturalist. And it's still the only record, like nobody has taken a picture of this and shared it on iNaturalist since. Um, last year at this time, maybe someone will see it this year. Um, it will be great to see if people can find this. It's an absolutely gorgeous um, flower. Right, and last year also, um, this really beautiful um, little bird is a red-faced warbler, and um, it was found in a, in a park in Long Beach, which is in Los Angeles County by Kim Moore. And um, this is when a lot of birds are migrating, and this bird hadn't been seen, though, in Los Angeles since 2005. And so this was like a huge find, and of course, like the next day after she took this picture, you know, 70 other people saw it and made observations because a lot of birders came to check it out. But you know, if you're out there um, in parks taking pictures, and and obviously this picture was not taken with an iPhone, so <laughs> this is a um, or an Android. 
Um, so you can also take pictures using a digital camera. Um, if you are a birder or a wildlife photographer, or you normally take pictures of like your kids playing sports and you have a really great camera, um, you can use it to take pictures of um, birds, especially, um, and things that are further away, which can be really important if we can't get lots of places right now. And then you can upload those on iNaturalist using your desktop or your laptop. There's an amazing upload feature um, and you can just do it from your memory card. Um, so it's not just iPhones, but this is a really nice find from last year. Um, and then this hooded pitcher plant was found um, just outside or just in Tallahassee, Florida. And this was a new population of this species of concern. So um, the parks and wildlife folks down there had been looking for this plant and they found a new population in the city um, that they didn't even know about because they were looking during City Nature Challenge. So a lot of times it's really just many eyes looking can help find things, even if people have been looking for them, professionals have been looking for them for a long time. And next slide. And then this is a tiny little insect. This is actually an invasive insect. And this is the picture you can kind of tell it's in a yellow sticky trap. So this was in a trap. People had been on the lookout for this um, psyllid because it's a pest. And, um, but this, during the City Nature Challenge, this was the first record of this species, not only in New Zealand, but in the entire Southern Hemisphere. So by paying attention and looking, and this is a sticky trap, but kind of like a pit trap that Allison was describing, like if you put out ways to attract insects, um, you can find things that you might not see otherwise. All right, and this is one of my favorites. So this is from, from 2017. This is from New York City um, in the Bronx um, in a building that's part of the New York Botanic Garden. And um, this little owlet, its parents or its mother laid the, its egg in an empty red-tailed hawk nest. And um, the little owlet had like fallen from the nest and was living on the, the window ledge. And um, so the people, Zach was, had been paying attention to this owlet and took a picture and uploaded this sweet little owlet for the City Nature Challenge. Um, and then to get to something a little bit smaller, this is kind of like what Allison was saying about native slugs and snails, that if you look under things, if you look under logs, if you look under planters, like in your backyard, but also in city parks, you know, a lot of city parks have logs that, that mark off the trails. And um, if you turn over those logs carefully, kind of push it, you know, like so you're you can let things escape and don't squish them when you put it back down. But you can also find really amazing native slugs and snails. Not to say that those non-native ones aren't amazing also, but these are really rare. So this um, Hemphill's Western slug was found last year and it's a tiny native. It's a snail. That's my mistake. It's a slug. This is not a snail. <laughs> um, it's only been shared on iNaturalist just a handful of times, and it's only one of two to three native slugs that are known from Los Angeles, and it's really, really small. And so this kind of um, observation can help us really um, understand distributions of rare native species. And then this is one of my favorites too. This is a picture of that was taken of a swallow-tailed kite in Miami, and um, Alyssa here was taking a picture of the bird and notice that it was holding something in its talons. And if you look really closely here, you can see there's a little iguana. <laughs> All right, next slide uh, or next picture. And you can see that this, this kite was holding this green iguana and she got to take photographs and document this whole thing. So she had made an observation of the swallowtail kite, but then also next, Allison, um, the iguana like hit the ground and survived and so she got to take a picture and share this observation of this iguana. So not only can you find wildlife, but you can find wildlife interactions in cities. All right, next. And then a couple of things I just added because they're amazing, right? So if you could set up a, a moth light, it, there are some incredible moths out there that you never see because they fly at night and you could be rewarded with a moth like this um, and to see moss that you could never even imagine how beautiful they are flying around at night right outside our doors. And then this was one of the most incredible observations from last year. This was an African leopard that was um, caught on a, a camera, a wildlife camera, uh, just in Cape Town. So near where people live. And this was an incredible find. And the community, they could identify this leopard so they knew because there's a lot of leopard tracking going on. And this actually won a contest that the Cape Town organizers had for like the number one observation 
of all of the City Nature Challenge last year. And if you remember, Cape Town won last year, so they had a lot of observations of a lot of species. Um, so, you know, we could also catch um, here in the Bay Area, you know, we could have wildlife cameras that um, see mountain lions or pumas on camera and um, people have seen them in security cameras as well. All right, next slide. And then this um, photo, this beetle from Hong Kong, I just thought was incredible. I have like a long um, desire to see a tiger beetle in the wild. Um, this one is from Hong Kong, but it's just incredible. And you know, it's really just getting out there and paying attention and you could be rewarded with some amazing species. And then this um, is another um, a, a worm like Allison found in her garden, but this is actually a different species and it was found last year in Oakland. Um, next slide, you can see its head a little more closely. So this is a kind of flatworm that's associated with the nursery trade, like Allison was saying. And um, so there are a few different species that have been introduced from Asia here, but this record that this picture that Carly took from Oakland was the first record of this species ever in the United States. And another awesome one, so up in Seattle, um, Kirstie took this photo from the shore in Seattle of um, a, actually a transient pod of orca whales. So she caught not the residents that live in Puget Sound, but ones that move all around. And so she took this picture um, from the shore. And a lot of coastal cities like us here in the Bay Area, you know, we have a chance to document marine mammals and fish and marine species um, during the City Nature Challenge. All right, and so then we wanted to share with you a couple of our favorite observations that we've made where we live during the City Nature Challenge. So for me, one of my most favorite observations of the, is of this tiny little plant. It's called a dot seed plantain. Um, it's really, really small, <laughs> just a few inches off the ground. Um, and we found this beautiful plant. Um, next picture. Um, up at this open space in San Francisco. This is my daughter. Um, we were looking for all these plants. This is a bio blitz that we did with for small children and their families. Um, and you can see this is just like in a neighborhood and it's you, you can see the city of San Francisco in the background. And to find a patch of this native um, plant is really incredible. And you can see it's surrounded by a lot of other um, grasses, European grasses. But this, this plant is super critical because, um, next slide, it's the food source for the, oh, it's in the back. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to fix it, but there's an amazing butterfly. And if you want to Google the Bay Checkers Fat Butterfly, which is a critically endangered butterfly um, that is not really found in San Francisco, except for some recent reintroductions, um, needs this plant for its food source. So if we can think about providing the food for butterflies that they need in these open spaces, um, we can hopefully keep them in their, where they're found and um, also bring them back. All right, and then the next one is just this really, like we live here in the city and you can see this photo, um, the one that's really dark my husband took um, one night during the City Nature Challenge when he was on a walk back from our community garden after watering it and he was kind of looking for species as well and he ran into this skunk. And um, on the other picture is a better picture by our friend um, Kat Chang so you could actually see the skunk. Um, but this was the only observation of a skunk during the City Nature Challenge made from the city, from San Francisco. And so I think it's one of those good reminders that there are things that come out at night, plants and or animals like moths and skunks, that if you get out there at different times, it's a good way to keep social distance so you can find um, a bunch of really exciting things. <laughs> and so I picked some of my favorite ones um, just from the county that I live in, not ones that I personally made. So I live in Sonoma County, which is just north of San Francisco. Um, and so some of my favorite observations that came in from previous city nature challenges in my county um, not taken by me, but this Pacific hagfish, uh, which is just an amazing observation because this is a deep sea fish that you would normally not get to see. Um, but they're often used as bait and people go out and fish for them. Um, like big ships go out and they trawl for them and they bring them back in. So this was actually taken uh, in Bodega Bay, which is on the shore of Sonoma County. Um, and someone found this washed up on the shore. Um, and so I just thought it was an amazing observation. It's the first time we've had a hagfish documented during the City Nature Challenge. <laughs> uh, so this came in. Um, uh, and in our in our county in 2018, and then we also have um, these right here. So if you've heard, if, you know, if you're in the Bay Area, or if you've heard, we've had a lot of fires. This is like the wine country area of the Bay Area, um, and so we had a big fire back in 2017 in the fall of 2017. 
Um, and so during the City Nature Challenge in 2018, people were actually able to document a bunch of fire followers. And these whispering bells, for example, hadn't been documented um, in the numbers that they were in Sonoma County for like 50 years or like 60 years since the last big fire that we had. Um, and then you can see that they were just carpeting all this area underneath these, this burned vegetation. Um, in Sonoma County. And so we had a ton of really amazing fire followers that year. And it was just a nice way for my community, you know, as part of the Bay Area, but especially up in like my smaller community in Sonoma County to really celebrate the fact, um, you know, that nature was returning to our area in the spring following this really big fire uh, that we had. So this is one of my favorite observations um, from the City Nature Challenge uh, where I live. And so um, I want to let you guys know if you're interested um, in just seeing, starting on Friday, once observations start getting made for the City Nature Challenge, if you're interested in seeing, you know, like, how is your city doing? Again, it's not a competition this year, but it's still fun to see like how many observations are coming in in your city compared to other cities and things like that. There's a couple places you can go and check. Um, we have a big, what we call an umbrella project on iNaturalist that has all of the City Nature Challenge projects um, in it. Uh, so you can see all of these little different flags on this map here are all the different cities that are um, doing the City Nature Challenge. Um, and you can go and uh, this will also have a leaderboard. And so you can actually look and see which which city is finding the most making the most observations and finding the most species and having the most people involved. Again, though, we don't want people to really think about this as a competition because we don't want people to go and break any of our COVID-19 regula regulations to go and make observations. But if you just want to see how your city is doing and also what the overall numbers are, this is a great way to, uh, to see that in real time. Um, the citynaturechallenge.org website, there are a few cities around the world that aren't using iNaturalist. And so to, if you wanna see how all the cities, all the observations coming in from around the whole world, um, if you go to the citynaturechallenge.org website, it has a city list and it's basically just gonna show the numbers from every city in that list. And we'll also have kind of a running total of like the, the full, all, all the observations coming in from the whole world. And so that's another place you can go and check and see um, how, how different cities are doing, what people are finding in different cities, things like that. And I do wanna say too, Rebecca talked about in California, um, if you're not in the City Nature Challenge city to go out and make observations on Friday. I also just wanna point out, this is uh, our friends at Science Friday um, on NPR have also made this project that if you're not in the City Nature Challenge city, or even if you are, you can join this project and your observations will contribute to this project during the City Nature Challenge as well. So we really encourage you, whether or not your city is participating in the City Nature Challenge this year, to go out and make observations wherever you are, in your backyard, in your neighborhoods, You know, keeping safe, keeping your family safe, keeping your community safe, but still celebrating the nature that's out there right now and having a chance, especially right after the 50th, Earth Day of, uh, 50th anniversary of Earth Day, to really get out there and connect with nature in the ways that we still can right now. Um, so you're welcome to join this project uh, to contribute your observations if your city is not participating or even if it is. Um, so again, I just wanna put up the important dates. Um, it starts basically 12.01 a.m. on Friday, go out and make observations of wild plants and animals, fungus using the iNaturalist app all the way until 11.59 p.m. on Monday morning or on Monday night. Mm -hmm. um, we have a week where you can get all your photos uploaded. Um, you can help with identifications and other people can take some time and look at your things that you uploaded and help try to get those down to species as well because that helps give us our total number of species that we saw together, the more things that get actually identified down to species. Um, and then on May 4th, the collective results will be, will be announced. So we'll announce how many observations across the whole world in those 245 cities, how many observations did we make, how many species did we find and how many people in their own ways got out and connected with nature. Um, during those four days of the City Nature Challenge. Um, so with that, well, thank you. We have our Twitter handles up there. If you wanna um, ask us any questions, you're welcome to tweet at us. We also have our iNaturalist handles if you wanna see the observations we're making. Um, those of us on iNaturalist and most of the websites that we talked about are listed here um, on this site is on the bottom of that page as well. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks to both of you. And I'm, those highlights were amazing. I'm especially happy I got to see Allison's impression of a flying iguana, which is like pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> um, and I love, those, yeah, I love the stories about the warbler and the pitcher plant observations, because it's, it's like kind of twofold. Like we, we live side by side with this urban nature every day, but we, that doesn't mean we know everything that's there. And also just the real power of what happens when you actually start looking every day and when lots of people do that, it's it's like pretty amazing. This project's very cool. Um, yeah. And also just like every time you show the light sheet photo, I just like, I cannot encourage people strongly enough to go do this. Like even if you've got like a pillowcase, a clothesline and a flashlight, you will be completely amazed at what comes to visit you um, in just the course of a couple hours. So try out there, try out all those, those and the, um, 
little pit traps and stuff like that. So cool. Okay, Bob, so Bob has a question and you you literally answered it kind of right at the end, I think, but he wanted to know um, basically if your city's not participating, if there was any way to contribute either to your city or your state. So you mentioned the Science Friday project. Is that the best thing to do or are there other ways that the person could contribute? Yeah, I mean, um, if you want to, I mean, if you contribute, if you add, join that Science Friday project, we'll actually be able to see that you are, we'll see your observations and that you were making them for the City Nature Challenge. Cool. You don't have to join that project too. You can also just make observations wherever you are. Um, but if you're in that project, we can actually see that you are there trying to make them you know, during the City Nature Challenge during this upcoming weekend as well. Um, so definitely join that project if you can and, and we can see your observations. Awesome. Okay, we'll drop that link in comments again. Um, and then we had several questions that are pretty similar from people who just really can't believe that their observations are helpful, even if they don't know the identification. <laughs> and so I just wonder, like, I know you speak to this all the time, but how do you, you know, like, how do you really help people understand that, you know, by them uploading a photo with the location, it actually turns into really powerful data? Yeah, I would just say, like, that example that Allison showed of that pill bug, right, is a really good example, right? So Jennifer, our friend and colleague, like is turning over logs, took a picture. She's like, I know this is a pill bug. And so she could have also just left that blank, but she uploaded it. You can also not put anything and it will just be unknown. It just takes a lot longer to be identified. So we encourage you to put some identification. Like even if you don't know much, like you can tell if something's a plant or a bird. And even you could just put that if you don't want to use the, the machine learning, but the machine learning is pretty good and will get you some suggestion. But, you know, she she could have been like, oh, she there are many pill bugs underneath it. She noticed they look a, looked a little different. So that's all you need to be able to do is like be curious and be able to tell things like they might be different. And even if you're wrong, it's fine. Like if they're the same, like take two, take a picture of each and upload them like it's fine. We're not using these data to count. For abundance, we're saying this species was found here now. So if more than one person takes a picture, it's fine. Or you upload five pictures of the same species, that's fine. But you know, because she could tell those two species looked a little different, she took two pictures and uploaded them. And she ended up rediscovering a species that hadn't been seen in like 80 years in the Bay Area, right? That's super, super important for science. And it's now been seen since because people kind of know where to look and they thought, okay, if she found it here, we probably can find it close by. And so that was just her sharing, right? And she didn't know that it was important. And there are so many times that I've made an observation that I don't even know what it is, right? I know it's a plant. Like I put flowering plant, like I know that. And I am a professional biologist. I'm like, I don't know what this is. But those data can be found by anyone. So if someone who's like, let's say I take a picture of a butterfly, that I don't really know, but someone is really interested in where that butterfly is found and how its range is changing through time, they can use my data point to help fuel their research. And so we don't know how those data are going to be used, but helping um, biodiversity scientists everywhere understand where species are found now, even if they're super common, is critically important. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, so Michelle mentioned that she was looking forward to having some, taking some wanders using Seek. And I wonder if, is, does Seek also, so Seek, in case you're not familiar with it, Seek by iNaturalist is another app um, from our group. But they, I'm wondering, do we need to clarify whether Seek is also useful for City Nature Challenge or whether people should just stick with the iNat app for this? Yeah, so um, Seek is kind of designed to be its own little like off, off, offline like way to discover nature um because it doesn't normally share your observations with iNaturalist if though you have connected your iNaturalist account to your seek account as well and you've told it to send your observations to iNaturalist that's fine if you haven't done that yet then either i'd say you know to connect those two accounts together or just make observations on iNaturalist okay perfect and seek is great for like families with kids who have privacy concerns and don't want it connected elsewhere is that right yeah, yeah exactly and Seek is amazing. It also like real time, if you hold your camera up to plants and animals, will suggest an ID without taking a picture. Um, it's incredible. So right. it's, it's really great. Right now, but it takes yeah. a few extra steps to send it to iNaturalist. So um, if you know for sure you want to send things to iNaturalist, I would start there. But if you're not sure or you have little kids with you and you want them to do one thing while you're using iNaturalist, you can um, like tag team 
and but make sure you hook your iNaturalist account up to see like Allison said. Perfect. Okay. Uh, so Janelle just wanted to clarify, if you're not in the Bay Area, but you are in a city that's participating, when you take an observation, how do you make sure it counts toward your city? Yeah, so um, luckily, as long as you make it within the boundary of your city, um, so go and check the project, see what boundaries they've included. As long as it's in the boundary and made between April 24th and April 27th, it should automatically show up in that project. And what you can do if you're concerned, you know, if you want to see, um, when you go to the project, it's going to show you like observations, species, identifiers, and observers. Click that observers button and you should see your name on the list. They'll, they'll sort it from the person who's made the most observations and then down. And so scroll down and just find yourself on that list. And you'll be able to see the number of observations that you have in that project. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. And this seems like a really good question to end with um, from Andrew. If your city isn't participating this year, what can you do to make it join next year? <laughs> so I think that the best way, that's awesome. I mean, we would love to have more cities participating. So I think right now on the citynaturechallenge.org website, there is a link that if you're interested in participating in 2021 um, to sign up um, and you'll be on the list of people who get contacted about joining the City Nature Challenge. So go to that website and add your name um, and you'll be included. And I, I, will, yeah. But yeah, I, will, I will say though that that's mainly we're looking for people who can organize in their yeah. city. So <laughs> if you're interested in having your city participate, but you don't have the capacity to actually organize your whole city between now and basically the end of the summer, start contacting the people in your city who might be willing to organize. Like if you have a nature center or a parks department or a natural history museum or a zoo and an aquarium, stuff like that, contact them and say, hey, I really want our city to be part of this next year. Do you have someone who can help organize? And then connect them to us by using yeah. that link. on Yeah, just by finding like, like an individual can't make it happen. You can make it happen if you're committed to doing all the organizing. <laughs> awesome. But um, yeah, make sure you find some good folks who have the time and bandwidth to, to make this happen. Okay, fantastic. Um, great, well, well, we'll stop there for now. Thank you so much again for coming back and telling us about this. And thank you so much to everybody who watched today. And for those watching, if you have kids in the house um, who are kind of roughly fourth to eighth grade, stick around. We've got another really special Earth Day program coming up from our education team. And that's gonna be streaming right here at 12.30 Pacific. So just in less than a couple hours. Um, and then just a quick mention that breakfast club wise, we've got an awesome rest of the week. Our herpetology curator, Dr. Raina Bell will be here with an amazing mini class on um, frogs, toads, turtles, tortoises, salamanders, more. And um, Friday morning, we're celebrating World Penguin Day uh, with Vicki McCloskey, who's a curator at Steinhardt Aquarium. And we're gonna stream live from our African penguin colony. So, okay, that's it. Download our free iNaturalist app, please. You'll love it. There's links for um, iPhones and Androids in the comment section. Um, get out there and make observations April 24th through 27th. Um, anything I'm missing? You got it. Okay, awesome. Yeah, it's great. Getting better at this. Um, yeah, have fun. <laughs> have fun, yeah. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Allison, Rebecca, everyone who watched, and uh, very happy Earth Day. Bye. Bye, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day. <laughs>